Can someone turn the lights back on? Okay, um, we should try and start. It's a very great pleasure uh, to welcome Cornelia Parker, um, whose work I'm sure will be well known to you and can be seen uh, as part of her being shortlisted for the Turner at the Tate. Um, she was trained at Gloucester College of Art and Design, Wolverhampton Polytechnic and Reading University, and obviously has exhibited widely uh, both in group and in solo shows, including the Whitechapel Open in 1985 and 1992, and through the viewfinder, stitching the Apple Amsterdam. An exhibition of her work is planned for the Serpentine um, next year. Tonight she's going to uh, give a talk called The Voided Object. I'll be talking about all aspects of her work including installations, commissions, and collaborations made over the last year. It's a very great pleasure on your behalf to welcome Cornelia Parker. Can everybody hear me through this mic? Yeah. Um, can we have the lights off? Um, it's not going to be work made over the last year, it's going to be work made over the last 10, 12 years. <laughs> Um, so, um, the, yeah, the slides I'm going to show you are from work from 1985 onwards, um, and, you know, I, as, I, as you realise, I didn't go to a London college, so, um, you know, me moving to London was quite a big thing. Um, this, was, this happened in, 19, in 1984, um, after I'd spent a summer in New York. Um, I moved to London and I decided not to work in a studio. Decided to, for financial reasons, I decided to work at home. And the, the house that you see on the slide is where I made work for several years. Um, at the time I started to make work in the house, it was a very temporary accommodation. The M11 link road was going to come through the street and you know, all the houses were going to be demolished. Um, the, the actual road didn't come through until um, about three years ago. It's when I left this area. Um, this was my bedroom at the time, and I decided to make work, as I said, um, at home, just because I, I think going to the studio every day, um, you know, a sort of four white walls and a concrete floor, um, and then going home in the evening, it just didn't seem like the work related to my, you know, to my everyday life. And so when I came back from New York, I had this amazing experience, and I was just thinking how I could possibly encapsulate this experience. Um, on my travels over the years, I'd collected uh, architectural souvenirs um, from uh, famous monuments. Um, and these are the sort of thing I'd have in my bedroom. Um, mostly the nearest thing you get to sculpture in the home, you know, uh, in terms of uh, people might have them on the top of their um, TV or mantelpiece. And so I decided to use the Empire State Building, this little crude kind of cipher of a famous monument, as, as the beginning for a piece of work. So I made um, a mould off the um, souvenir, which was already like an abstraction, and mass produced it from, in lead, and made the leads in, into plumb lines. So it was like the, the beginnings of, of a, like a building. Um, next slide. Oh, sorry, I'll, I'll do the slides. <laughs> um, when I was making these crude casts, um, because in my first half of my degree I, I was doing painting, I missed all the induction courses that you would have for sculpture, so I didn't learn how to, to cast or to weld or you know, to carve or to do any of those kind of things. And um, So I taught myself how to cast um, the way you'd cast tin soldiers. Um, so I was doing it on my kitchen stove, you know, with a frying pan with lead in it, and, <laughs> and making quite a mess, and lead was falling on the floor. And I decided I wanted to make the splashes of lead into images too, so these became images of a ship, which was a tin ship, another thing that I'd bought as a souvenir. So this piece was called um, Falling Towers and Sinking Ships, and this was a turning point in the, in the work. Before, I was making very ephemeral things, um, using all kinds of ephemeral materials, but I really enjoyed the idea of using lead, the sort of most densest metal, to make something that's quite ephemeral. Um, 
as, as when I lived in this house, other people moved into the house, and um, you know, I, I still wanted to work at home. And I said, "Would well, you mind me making, you know, using the, the house as a studio?" And they said they didn't mind as long as I had the way. So I started using the ceilings and you know, little nooks and crannies for available space to make a sculpture. I started to use the furniture too because that's the sort of thing you have in a house. So the you know, the, you know, the materials that are around me seem to become, become very important. Um, drawing was a concern of mine, always has been, and I always, always think of my work as, as a kind of drawing, really. Um, so this is a three-dimensional drawing that goes up the wall, and the uh, little images that are hanging off the drawing, which are almost like pencil marks in a way, are um, little lead casts of a battleship. Um, the battleship was a little model battleship I bought at a junk shop, which was made up of little blocks of wood. And it was again like the Empire State Building. It was a kind of very crude representation of something massive, you know, something that did exist in the world. Um, but by mass producing it many times from the same mould, it sort of became almost like, I don't know, you know a pencil mark or a you know, fish or a kind of fly or all kinds <coughs> of things. Um, on the table, which I you know, cut and drew on, um, the table be also became a, a drawing, um, I placed the original battleship. I quite like the, you know, looking up from the table at the ceiling, it looked like an aerial photograph. Um, this piece was sort of quite an important piece for me because it encapsulates this idea of the monument, the idea of the monument being a fleeting thing. This piece was called Fleeting Monument. I like the idea of something that's supposed to last forever, being something that could evaporate or be spilt or, you know, kind of break into a thousand pieces. Um, this is Big Ben, another thing, <coughs> very cliched souvenirs. And around the edge is the, the, the Big Ben is beginning to break up because the mould began to break up. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I've, I've sort of filled up the house <laughs> and I was looking for, you know, as I say, any nook and cranny that I could, you know, sort of make my own. This was my bath water that, um, um, and the, the, the gutter was blocked up by some more of these monuments. Um, this piece was called Drown Monuments. Um, and I had these old encyclopedias, which I've had since childhood, which are very old, you know, I think they're 1930s. And in that, those encyclopedias, they use famous buildings to measure the unmeasurable. You know, they use St. Paul's Cathedral to measure Everest. You know, they use, you know, sort of uh, Sagrada Familia to, to, to measure the smallest planet beside. And so this was me measuring how deep my bath water was. <laughs> Um, this is a, an archway in between um, London Bridge um, Station and um, Southwark Cathedral. This was one of the first commissions I did. This was for um, Bookworks, and it, it was a um, project called Siteworks, where three art, artists made site-specific work around an area. Langs and Bell made a film um, based on this area, and I did this piece. Um, the archway was dripping natural stalactites. And this it was a commuter route. People would go through this um, archway all the time. Um, and I just wanted to draw attention to those stalactites. So I, I made this cathedral ground plan out of St. Paul's Cathedral. This is St. Paul's Cathedral. And then I used about nine or ten different cathedrals from around Europe um, in model form to make this kind of stalactite city. And it was there long enough for the stalactites to form around the spires. So um, you know, when you looked up, you, you, it looked like an aerial photograph again. Um, and it was very subliminal, you might not notice it, but because people use the, the, the route daily, you know, it's the sort of thing that might grow on you. Uh, this, this piece actually got stolen piece by piece and sort of became a souvenir again. You know, so I quite like that, <laughs> it's very circular. Um, the next few slides of a piece of work I did in a, a gallery um, that doesn't exist anymore, but on, on Narrow Street, in, um, on the edge of the Isle of Dogs, and um, 100 yards away from the gallery was um, St Anne's of Limehouse, as Hawksmoor Church. And um, part of the brief of the exhibition was to actually make a piece of work in the gallery and a piece of work outside. So I made a piece of work inside the, the locked tower of the Hawksmoor Church. Um, the, the, the church tower had all kinds of things in it. It had um, 
lead that had been stripped off the church roof, you know, I, I think perhaps 50 or 100 years before, very old lead. So I used this lead to, 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 bit, you know, to, use, to make these cathedrals. This is the last time I used you know, this cathedral image in, in my work. This is on the bell, which was encrusted with pigeon shit. I mean, the whole place was very run down. It's been refurbished since then. Um, and I like the way that the um, pigeons shat on everything and, <laughs> and very quickly made it into stalagmites. This is underneath the bell, which is like mountains of pigeon shit. And uh, I placed <laughs> cathedrals on the top of these mountains. Again, it was like an aerial photograph. It looked like you know, some, a city after being bombed. Um, and, I, and I thought I didn't really want people trampling around the tower trying to find these things. So I decided the only way that people could see the work was through photography. You know, and that would be exhibited in the gallery opposite. And you could look at the locked tower out of the gallery window and read the photographs and imagine you're in that kind of space. So it's about a private space. Um, this is the first time I used silver in my work, um, which I'm still, still using and I'm still very much drawn to it as a material. I think the reason I'm drawn, drawn to it as a material is because it has this ability, it's, it, first of all it's the most reflective metal that exists, um, but it also has this ability to turn black, so it has this duality, you know, it has the kind of sublime and the sort of the dark side. And I cut various objects in half. I was going to put half in the gallery and half in the, in the, in the tower, so the piece was split between the two spaces. This is me, me placing this half, half goblet beside some, a drawing made by pigeons. Um, this is half of a goblet with a cathedral upside down in it. Um, I think at the time I'd <laughs> just read, read Gaston Bachelard's Poetics of Space, and I was really you know, into this idea of immensity inside little tiny things. Um, this is not a very good slide. This is uh, the work coming in through the gallery window uh, in the form of cathedrals and going out again immediately. Um, having spent a lot of time locked up in the tower, I think I was going through a sort of, you know, quite depressive, introverted stage, and I, I really liked being in the tower. So when we got in the gallery, it was sort of a very sort of scary white space. So the work just went in and out of the walls as if, you know, that wasn't the place it might reside. It might be in the house down the street or it might be in the laundrette or... I mean, I think the whole idea of sculpture of me was the idea of it being a porous thing, something that wasn't a monumental thing, it wasn't a giant lump in the middle of the space, it was something that was molecular and that was porous and that, that could go anywhere. And this is, I think, what this piece turned out to be about. It disappeared into the stair cupboard, which was the equivalent to the tower, and ended up in the other half of the goblet. Um, I did a little residency in the Forest of Dean, um, and I did various works there, and this was a work which is me, required me to put back leaves on the trees. <laughs> um, so I, all these dead trees where, you know, that they've just died and there's no foliage anymore, I, I just replaced the um, leaves with um, lead facsimiles, which were poisonous, you know, um, so they, they mimic the bracket fungi on the sort of withered stump behind. And I think it's quite nice because people walking through the forest might imagine it to be a natural object, but it's just not, it's out of sync, it's not in the right place. Um, in, the, in the Forest of Dean, I met a steamroller driver. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, it, this set, you know, a train of thought going. I was making a piece of work, a large installation for the Icon Gallery in Birmingham, and um, the silver, you know, the fascination with silver was growing. And I, I, I like the whole idea of um, cartoon death. You know, in cartoons, you get roadrunner run over by a steamroller, and he's flat for a couple of seconds, and he pings up again. It's like a symbolic death. It's not a real death. It's a sort of um, just a state he goes through. Um, and I, I like this idea of killing things off, the idea of eroding the monument. <laughs> and in this case, the monuments were actually personal artifacts. They were... Um, you know, souvenirs, or there were wedding presents, or there were uh, things you got for christenings, or there were you know, you know, treasured objects. But uh, you know, and all this stuff was silver plate. It wasn't solid silver or anything. It was just you know, cheap, kind of had the most superficial layer of silver. Um, but still, you know, it was it, it, it had meaning. And I wanted to give all the objects the same destiny, the same fate. So, on this lonely road. <laughs> 
you know, in Chorley Wood, this steam mill went over and crushed the lot and killed them. Um, and then I resurrected them in the gallery. Um, could you focus that? Or shall I focus it? Um, this is at the Icon Gallery in Birmingham. This is um, the, into 30 pieces. I called it 30 pieces of silver. I think I thought the title was a kind of very portentous sort of title from the Bible about the, the biggest betrayal. Um, you know, the 30 pieces of silver that was, Judas was paid to betray Christ. Um, and then the steamroller, you know, running over the objects, which was like a kind of tragicomic, you know, triptych, was the title, the process, and then the work in between. Um, what, was the, what I liked about this piece, that um, this is when it was in the Hayward Gallery in 1990s, part of the British Art Show, was this show was on long enough for it, it to start tarnishing. You know, I think it was on for about six weeks, and, you know, it started to go brown. And if, it's, if it sort of was hung permanently, it would just go completely black, and that would be a fantastic thing, I think. You might not even know it was silver. Um, <coughs> After doing a piece called 30 Pieces of Silver, um, I decided another monument was money. <laughs> and, um, you know, when I was asked to do a piece of work for the Corner House in Manchester, um, there was a certain amount of money materials. And I said, how much money is there for materials? Can I have the money, you know, as a material? You know, <laughs> and I'll go on holiday or <laughs> do something much more exciting. With it. Um, but I got it all in silver currency. Um, and I also had a, um, a silver foreign silver cu currency party at my house where everybody had to bring their silver foreign, foreign currency to donate to the pot. And then, uh, and then um, the piece was run over by a train. All the pieces of, you know, all the pieces of silver were run over by a train, which is what I used to do with my pocket money when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> and when you, you know, have your pocket money running over by a train, you don't spend it, obviously, because there's nothing you can spend it on. It's not worth anything anymore. But you keep it for years as a souvenir of this kind of you know, meeting with death that you had. Um, so so um, by eroding the worth of the money, by having it run over in this cartoon way, you know, like the, the steamroller, um, I resurrected it again by suspending it um, in the form of two figures. Um, the piece is called Matter and What It Means. And there's about 5,000 metal wires there. Um, I never used nylon wire. I only used metal or or thread because I like the physicality of the wire. It's not like I'm pretending this thing is hovering. You know, it's the physicality of the mechanism that I'm interested in. And on the floor is um, piles of coins in the shadow which are dirty, which got dirtied by the train, the oil from the train running over them. And I polished the ones in the air up. It's about 5,000 in the air that are suspended. But I could all call all my pieces matter and what it means, really, because that's the sort of that's the title I got for my encyclopedia. Um, this was the nearest I ever got to a performance. You know, some people say, oh, why don't you do performance art? Because you know, the process seems so important to you. And I actually really found out with this piece that I didn't really want to be a performance artist. <laughs> and this was an installation which got destroyed by the train pulling out. Um, and it was called Left Luggage. And the objects on the are suitcases that have been drilled full of holes, and there's handkerchiefs coming out of the holes that are tied to the train or down back to the platform, a bit like Gulliver's Travels or something. Um, and when, you know, this idea of, it's almost like a cumulative departure. I quite like the handkerchiefs because they were like sentimental kind of gestures of goodbye. And so when the train pulled out, I think the audience on the platform were expecting, you know, balloons to go up and <laughs> there to be some kind of big fanfare. But really what they were left with was a huge anticlimax and lots of empty luggage, you know, so hence the, the title, Left Luggage. <laughs> so it was like, a, I think it was about really <coughs> the territory of the, the, the build-up you get before a departure and then the, the emptiness you feel afterwards. Um, a lot of the pieces I've done have been called inhaled or exhaled. I think it relates to this idea of trying to digest something monumental, you know, trying to make it porous. Um, this is that, that project with the train and this next couple of pieces um, are, were commissioned by EDGE, which were um, a sort of installation and performance festival, international one, that happened in three different cities over a six-year period, every two years. And this is in Glasgow. This is a, a schoolhouse that had been recently vacated. And after you know, been, you know, the, the place had been vacated, all that was left was boxes of chalk. 
and I decided to just use a chalk to make a giant drawing. So the whole of the schoolhouse is completely covered. I don't know if you can tell from this slide, but... Um, but, I, but I went over the whole surface of the schoolhouse, <coughs> making s downward strokes, and the only variance in those strokes was around the edges of the, of the window sills. And this piece was called Exhaled Schoolhouse. And I, you know, I had three other people help me. But the, thing, the most important thing about the piece for me was that I touched every bit of the building. You know, I, I knew every bit of the building by the time I'd finished. Um, and the piece gradually would be worn away by rain. I mean, it would take a long time for the building to reappear. And a bit like the um, phthalactite piece, it was very subtle, and people might, <coughs> not, might not even notice it. Um, yeah. So it was, it was sort of um, almost an invisible work, in a way. But um, I like the subtlety of it, and the quietness of it. And somebody might just notice it. Um, and watch the building gradually reappear. And what I liked the idea of was if you know, rain did wear it away, that little bits would be left underneath the eaves and you know, in places where rain can't get to it. Um, this piece was called Inhale Roof, and this was another piece for Edge. And this was in an attic room in Newcastle, uh, underneath a copper dome. And this was the, the kind of section underneath the dome which I lined with copper foil, so it was almost like wallpapering the room with copper. Because it was inside and not outside, the copper was shiny and not um, kind of patinated like the green outside. Um, and so the, the whole thing became a light box that changed from dawn to dusk. I mean, the, f the, 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 the two green bits in this, um, I'm not quite so sure about now. I think I would have preferred to have left them out, or at least the letters on the floor. The, the thing pointing down is a lightning conductor which was patinated green anyway. Um, and it's pointing down to the room, so it's we've placed the light fitting. And the, on the floor, these letters are from, I found them in the attic room. They're the name of the shop outside. You know, they're, they're redundant letters. Um, this is the kind of small work I was making at the time. This is um, called Small Fort. And this was a circuit, for, circuit board, which is, um, I found, found, I think I found it in a skip in Rome. Um, this is why I made this piece, and, and circulating through it was black dried fruit. And I quite like the, the contrary energies of the circuit board that's a kind of almost like a rational system, and this more emotional stuff which was stickily sort of ploughing its way through it. Um, this was a piece I did for Chisholm Gallery um, in the East End of London. Um, and this this, uh, and this is another monument, really. This is a very domestic monument. This is a garden shed full of objects you normally find in a garden shed. You know, tools, overspill from the house. Um, and in the shed is a light bulb. And this is a photograph of the piece in the gallery before the exhibition. Um, and then the garden shed was subjected to another cartoon death, which was to be blown up um, by the British Army, um, which was... <laughs> Um, I knew I wanted to blow the shed up, but I, I, I thought about who I'd want to blow it up for me, because I obviously couldn't do it myself. And, and I didn't want demolition people, I didn't want special effects people. You know, it, it felt like it needed to be another institution. And the idea of working with somebody like the army, which it was just after the Gulf War, so um, you know, they were very unpopular. And the idea of you, you know, working with someone who is contrary to, what, to the life I was leading was, became very appealing. Um, so that whole experience of doing this piece was, for me, fantastic. Um, the piece was called Cold Dark Matter and Exploded View. Um, and the resulting piece was the fragments of the garden shed re reassembled in the gallery in the same place where the original photograph was taken, um, suspended around the same light bulb um, in a very formal way. Um, it might not look very formal from this photograph because the shadows break it up. But the small objects that are surrounding the light bulb and then the, the medium objects and then the, the bigger pieces of wood on the outside. So the whole, whole thing looked like it could be imploding or exploding. And the title, as I said, was Cold Dark Matter and Exploded View. And the time I was making this piece of work, um, cold dark matter was a word that was banded around in the press as a new kind of scientific term to describe matter in the universe that was unquantifiable, the stuff that you knew existed but was I immeasurable and you couldn't see it. Um, and an exploded view is a diagram, you know, the way 
in car manuals, the, the engine of the car is laid out in various parts so you can see you know, how the engine works. So the whole idea of trying to quantify something that was unquantifiable, um, the way I was doing with the monuments before, measuring my bath water, it was a very similar kind of process. Um, this is members of the army <laughs> helping me pick, pick up the pieces. <laughs> There's a lot of men involved scouring the field, you know. <laughs> and these are the fragments they help pick up, and that's a view inside the shed. Um, this is under uh, the White Cliffs of Dover. Um, after doing this piece where a shed had been blown up, um, I was making some work for a gallery in Leipzig in the former East Germany, and I decided to make a a series of works about things that had fallen off the White Cliffs of Dover, which were at the edge of England, that pointed towards Germany. Um, so this is a house that's fallen off the White Cliffs of Dover that's been made into a, a pebble by the sea. And I collected enough pebbles made you know, out of these houses to, to, to form another kind of house. And this is them fall, landing in Leipzig. So it's a house that's fallen off the White Cliffs of Dover that's now landing in Leipzig. Um, and it's landed in Ljubljana, and it's landed in South London Gallery <laughs> in London. And I quite like this thing, sort of reassembling. And it's called Neither From Nor Towards. It's in limbo between either coming back together again or falling apart. But unlike the shed, which took a split second to dest be destroyed, this took many years. You know. And I like that idea. It's like the fleeting monument, you know, the idea of something that is, is fixed in time, being uh, ephemeral and, and porous. And that's the original, that's the, the first slide you saw of the, the piece of, of brick on the beach, is that one there. This is in an archaeological dig in the Fens. Which I worked with the archaeological unit of Cambridge University, and they were doing this dig. These are two pits they've made, um, face to, you know, edge to edge. And um, I buried a spoon in their excavation. Um, so instead of them, things being retrieved out of the ground, I was putting something back. And this was like a, I think it was early 1800s Norwegian silver spoon engraved with the day it was buried in this dig. <laughs> so, you know, further excavations in the future will find this very maverick thing that they can't place at all. <laughs> uh, another idea that I, I was hoping to do at the time was to set fire to the pits, because it's like a clay, and fire these two, um, two pits, which would be pots, the shape of the excavation. Um, but it was so waterlogged, as you can see, it just, it, it just wasn't possible. Perhaps a, f a future piece. And that's the hole that I carved with the spoon. Um, the piece was called The Spoon That Excavated Itself. Um, and it was a bit like putting the leaves back on the tree in the earlier work. Um, I did a series of postcards um, drawings that um, were made inside St Pancras Hotel um, and I always tried to get inside St Pancras Hotel which you know to do to make work but it was never allowed access and with the idea of making something very ephemeral that would just be washed away and or could be taken away and just making photographs of it um, you know this they allowed me to do that and this this kind of piece of wallpaper that's been taken off the wall has not been taken away by me it's been taken away by archaeologists in re restoring the building and I, all I did was kind of redraw it on the, on the step, the, you know, the fragment of wallpaper. It's called exhaled wallpaper. And this is another piece which is called exhaled necklace. And it's um, a, um, a child's pearl necklace that was, um, I discovered in one of the rooms. Uh, uh, it's pulsating. <laughs> <laughs> it's the ghost. <laughs> Why, why is it pulsating? <laughs> um, anyway, but the pearl necklace was su suspended around this broken pearl <coughs> light bulb. Um, and, and the light on the pearls is not coming from the light bulb, obviously. It's coming from a window over to the um, right. So it's a kind of, um, you know, just a, a little trace of light coming in. And it was called exhale necklace. Hmm. I'm trying to go forward, but I can't. Oh, good. Oh, <laughs> so I feel seasick. <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> what's happened? It's going out of control. <laughs> Don't look at it. <laughs> oh. 
God. Is it me? Is everybody seeing this? Or <laughs> um, anyway, this was um, one of the Whitechapel opens that was mentioned in the brief um, uh, sort of introduction. Um, this is Spitalfields Market before it became the market it is now. Um, it was, used to be a fruit and vegetable market and a flower market. And, I <laughs> and this is a superintendent's um, kind of kiosk, that, um, which was now derelict. And I made this piece in it, which we, you could see from outside. I've got no control over it anymore. <laughs> is it possible to do it from there? Can you the slide? Yes, thank you. Oh no, back forward. <laughs> what, what's happening with the focus? Is it something out of your control? <laughs> it's, anyways, this piece is called Fruit Swarm. And if you wanted to go up the stairs, you couldn't get in the room. You could just see it through a chink in the door. So it's like this kind of, you know, fruit malignant thing. Um, this is in Leipzig again in a museum. Um, in Leipzig, this is 93, I think, um, the whole place had changed dramatically since the time I'd been there before because the whole kind of east-west thing was happening. Um, this is, um, all the windows of this museum on both sides of the room were lined with glass shells. On the glass shells was glassware, um, which I'd borrowed from various places, from, you know, the opera, from local bars, you know, from, from the university science department. And I filled these... Um, pieces of glassware with um, water and wine. You know, the top shelf is water and the bottom shelf is wine and the rest are kind of a mixture of the two. And the piece was called Another Matter and over the duration of the show it either evaporated, grew mould, the whole thing changed anyway, it became a very different matter altogether. You know, the whole thing started off as something very quite lyrical and beautiful and ended up in, in something quite malevolent. <laughs> Um, this is a piece that I did um, in the Sao Paulo Biennale in um, 1994, um, which is called An Another Matter Again. This is a coffin, which I thought was another kind of monument to a road. You know, it's again like the Empire State Building. People all over the world know what this this image means. You know, it's a kind of cliche. Um, and I decided I wanted to unpick, you know, you know, to to break it apart. So I used a hammer and chisel. Um, and splintered the coffin. And then I took the, um, the little pieces to a match factory. Um, could I have the next slide, please? And, and dipped it in match material. Um, so the, each little piece of wood had its own potential life and death. You know, so it was almost like, instead of the, the coffin being about this finite, dark thing, um, it became about potential. Those are the coffin handles. It's, it's very weird trying to buy a coffin in um, Sao Paulo, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, especially when most of them were made out of either chipboard or ply plywood or tin, you know, with wood grain on them. So <laughs> finding a solid coffin was quite difficult. Um, this this piece, I'm, I'm sure you heard about. This was a collaboration that I did with Tilda Swinton at the Serpentine Gallery a couple of years ago. Um, Tilda approached me to, to make a piece of work with her. Um, she wanted to do a piece where she slept um, as a kind of Snow White type mythological figure um, in limbo. And my role you know, in the collaboration was to, to give her another kind of frame, as it were, another context. Um, so she slept in the end as herself um, because you know, she most probably was inherently more interesting than being a fictional character, than being, being herself. And, and she was surrounded by other glass cases in the four rooms, which contained uh, relics from people who were no longer living. Um, all the belongings that were there could have been belonged to one person. There were sort of shoes and gloves and, and stockings. And, and this was a, um, a blanket and a pillow, which in the show was laid out. You know, it was a pillow at one end of the blanket. And this was off Freud's couch. Um, next slide, please. And this is Napoleon's rosary. Um, it's funny about Napoleon, I never really thought about him having a religious life. Um, next slide. Um, these were the, the Scott of the Antarctica's last provisions that were found in his tent with him. So there were things that he couldn't digest. There was um, salt, tea, curry powder, all kinds of you know, materials that he couldn't actually ingest. Um, 
it's very odd when I borrowed this particular object. It was in a box that um, I opened up, and a big cloud of curry powder sort of filled my <laughs> face when I opened this box because one of the, the bags was torn, and I sort of inhaled this um, curry powder, which was, you know, congested me for several days. And I just thought, this is incredible that I've just inhaled Scott of the Antarctica's last provisions. <laughs> and if I'd had the presence of mind, I'd have taken a microscopic photograph of the inside of my nose. But I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> this was um, the pen with which Charles Dickens wrote his last novel, um, The Mystery of Edwin Drood. And I'm sure he used many, many feathers to write his last novel. And he must have got through thousands of feathers through his lifetime. But this, this feather was obviously saved because it was his. And you know, perhaps at the moment of his death, a memento was kept. Um, this was um, the camera which belonged to Lee Miller, who was... Um, a famous war photographer and the muse of Man Ray. Um, and this camera took photographs of the models and um, you know, Dachau, because she was one of the first people to go into Dachau. So it had this kind of real malign and benign thing going on with the camera. Um, this is the only bit of body I had in the show other than Tilda, which was a piece, it was a, um, Babbage's brain, the man who was responsible for the origins of the computer. He's got a lot to answer for. <laughs> and this was put in the same glass case as Faraday's spark apparatus, you know, the founder of electricity. So this was almost like a Frankenstein monster at the end of the show. But a few of the objects were paired up, so there was kind of cross-pollination of ideas going. They were reanimated by the, the juxtaposition. And next slide, please. This is Queen Victoria's stocking um, <laughs> with her crest. And th this was placed next to the next slide. Next slide, please. Um, Wesley, Wesley, the founder of Methodism, Spurs. Um, and neither of them were thought of as having a sex life, almost. So it was almost like a kind of weird... Um, there was a hole in her stocking which had been darned, which possibly could have been made by Wesley Spurs. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is Florence Nightingale's slate. Um, I went to the Florence Nightingale muse Museum and there was all kinds of things on offer, like lanterns of hers, you know, which I thought of having, but this was, for me, the most interesting object because it was like a tabula rasa, it was like a blank slate, and her childish handwriting at the top of the frame was, was made before she became famous. She actually became famous for only a year in her life, really, when she did this, this thing about nursing. And, you know, that, you know, somehow it was a very weird, this was like a premonition. Um, <coughs> this was uh, the only object in the show. Can you focus that? Um, only object in the show which um, nobody really knew what it was. I mean, I think everybody knew the stories behind. There's all kinds of layers of fame going on. But this was called Sadie's drawing, and it's actually made by a cat jumping in and out of a window. Um, and the, the owners, of this cat who died tragically, framed up this piece of card which they'd used to protect the wallpaper from the cat scratches and, and made it into a kind of drawing because, you know, as a sentimental object, as a kind of memento, a souvenir of the cat. <laughs> so um, that was very poignant. Um, the, the last few slides are of um, a, a new series of work which is called Avoided Object. And this was my first attempt to send a meteorite back into space. Uh, this was in uh, Tivoli Gardens in um, Copenhagen last year. Um, I was asked to make a piece of work for any specified site in, in uh, Copenhagen. And um, I went to Tivoli Gardens, and they have a twice-weekly firework display. So I um, worked with the firework maker who makes the fireworks for Tivoli Gardens, Lars Barford. And um, I bought a, quite a large meteorite and ground it up into tiny pieces and put a piece of metal meteorite in all the fireworks that went up in the air over a four-month period in Tivoli Gardens. So it was like a kind of four-month-long meteorite shower because, <laughs> because the, the iron in the meteorite actually ignites and is expressed as light. So it was a kind of, you know, sending it back up and letting it come down again. <coughs> this is another piece which is called um, Meteorite Landing in Ep Epping Forest, um, <laughs> which just exists as a photograph. This is um, a firework I had made that was completely made out of meteorite. So what you're looking at is meteoric light. So it's, it is the light from the meteorite that you're seeing. Um, this is a shirt that's been burnt by a meteorite. <laughs> um, the burn has been made by me heating up the meteorite on the kitchen, you know, on the stove and applying it to the back of the shirt as an instrument of torture. Um, this is um, called One Day This Glass Will Break. And I think it's 
you know, reasonably self-explanatory. Um, the whole thing about the avoided object series, which some of the work is in the Tate at the moment, is the idea of they're very small things. They're almost like drawings, and they're, they're things that either have not yet got a life, like this, which is embryo firearms. These are Colt 45 guns in the earliest stage of production. This is, you know, if, they, if anything more happens to these blank pieces of metal, which I got from the Colt manufacturers, you know, they become guns. You know, they, any more drill holes, any bits attached. So this is the last time I could take them as, as a kind of non-guns. And um, I asked them to polish them, to finish, give them the finish that they would give the, the finished guns. So they were finished at this point. Um, so, the, so the voided object was about the kind of things that had not yet become objects, or the, the fallout of making objects, or they're the things you avoid perhaps psychologically. Um, next slide, please. This is um, a suit shot by a pearl necklace. Um, so the holes in the suit, next slide please, um, are made by pearls, not by um, bullets. So uh, the Colt firearms um, engineers helped me fire things through guns that were not bullets. So to replace the shot or the bullet, you know, the, the pearls were placed. So I, I quite like this idea of little, little small things that are very benign and very sweet being quite <coughs> le lethal if they have you know, the right kind of <coughs> pressure behind them. You know, if you drop a sandwich off the Empire State Building, apparently it can kill someone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, could, could you go back to the last slide? This is, um, this is a dress shot by small change. That's the, ma the money out of the man's pocket, but you can see money makes much bigger holes than pearls. <laughs> um, this is embryo money. This is, um, you know, the blanks from 10p pieces, which I got from the Royal Mint. I was trying to get the um, blank sheets of you know, five pound notes, but they wouldn't give me that. That was really, you know, one of the few things I've not managed to get. This is the negative of words, which is the residue that's engraved from silver, you know, to make, when you go to have something engraved on, on something silver, it's usually a monumental thing that you, you engrave, you know, somebody's name or a kind of anniversary. And I've been going to this engraver for years, having things engraved, and I asked him to save all the little kind of tendrils of silver that he excavates. So he does all this by hand. It's take, taken many years to build up a sizable pile. And I really like this idea that these, this, this fallout from the negative of words, you know, that this inverse of the monument might be what it might be, what it might sound like. The next slide. These are pornographic drawings, um, called pornographic drawings because the, the substance with which they were made were, was pornographic once. <laughs> and perhaps this again, I'm not sure. Because <laughs> um, these are raw shot blots, it's up to the you know, the person who's looking at them to determine whether they're pornographic or not. But I, made, I, I worked with the Customs and Excise um, in Cardiff last year when I was doing this show called The Voided Object in, in Chapter. And um, I asked them to give, give me things that they'd killed off. The thing I like about the Customs and Excise is in the press, you see them visibly killing things off, you know, s steamrolling <laughs> Rolexes, you know, smashing up bottles of perfume, setting fire to big mountains of cocaine and, you know, sort of marijuana. And, and, and they have to be visibly seen to be getting rid of things. And I like this cartoon quality of that. So um, I spent some time with them. And they gave me, the first thing they would give me um, was chopped up pornography and videotape which I originally thought I might try and edit back together, but it was, far too <laughs> it was far too mangled to do. So I made an ink out of it and made these raw shot blots. Um, this is um, a pair of bed sheets that have been starched with the White Cliffs of Dover, um, chalk from the White Cliffs of Dover. When I was working with the Customs and Excise, they told me they would just smuggle things through customs, which, you know, like... Um, Cocaine. People would starch their clothing with cocaine and walk through customs. You know, they were the way they were talking about objects was fantastic. They would pick up a glass of water. You know, Michael Craig Martin, eat your heart out, and say, "What space within this object is there? A, is there a place for concealment?" <laughs> 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 you know, so they were always looking at every object in terms of the space within it that's hidden that you can hide something. So people, you know, would hide things in their hair or in their clothing or. In, inside their body or, you know, mould whole suitcases out of cocaine. And so I got the idea for doing this piece from them. <laughs> um, this is a, an object I threw off the White Cliffs of Dover a few years before, um, and which has not been polished to the day it was, was, it was thrown off. Next slide, please. This is called 20 Years of Tarnish. Um, what's on show here is the tarnish rather than the objects, although the, the objects happen to be wedding presents helps you read the, the meaning of the tarnish. 
Next slide, please. <laughs> um, this is the grooves and the record that belonged to Hitler. This is um, 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 a piece, you know, just a vinyl record that I took a microscopic photograph of the grooves, um, which I liked very much as a kind of image. You know, it looked like this aerial f photography that, you know, thing that I was obsessed with. Um, and, you know, I quite like this, this, this thing looking very benign and innocent, and somehow the, the scratches and the marks that were made on it were made perhaps, you know, while Hitler was listening to it. Um, after borrowing the Freud's blanket and pillow off his couch, I'm, you know, built up a relationship with the director of the Freud Museum, Erica Davis, who's very kind of open to artists working there. So I asked her if I could take feathers out of the pillow, uh, Freud's pillow off his couch, which has heard as much as Freud has, you know, little <coughs> innocent things have heard as, as much as all the literature that's ever been written about Freud or he's generated, you know, these, these things are silent witnesses of that. So I took, this, I took this feather and I put it in a glass slide and I projected it along the wall. So it became like an anamorphic sort of object. Um, and it became more like a missile, something that shot through a gun or, you know, an arrow. And I quite like this. It's called, proje called projection because that's literally what it is. And next slide, please. And this is another piece which was the dust out of the couch, dust and fibres from the couch, which projected along the wall looked like an explosion. Next slide. And that's, that's a kind of close-up. You know, and this is, you know, huge projection. So you were, and there's skin cells and hair follicles and all kinds of stuff in there. Um, and this is a piece that's in the Tate at the moment, which is, I've just been in Texas um, for a few months, and um, I, I had a, a residency at this art foundation there. And one of the cartoon deaths that I was, I'm still working my way through, <laughs> was an act of God. Um, so I was hoping in Texas to find something struck by lightning. And so the second day I was in Texas, I, I found a man who um, designs lightning protection for buildings and asked him if he could help me find things struck by lightning. And two days later, he phoned me up and told me a Baptist church had been struck by lightning. <laughs> so I couldn't believe my luck, so I drove down there. <laughs> and asked the Baptist minister if I could have the charcoal to make a, a, a drawing. And he said, yeah, you know, as long as you don't barbecue on it, he said. <laughs> and I asked him if, if I, what he thought about the, you know, the idea of his church being struck by lightning. You know, what did that mean in terms of God? You know, he said, well, God wants us to have a better church. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this, this piece carries on with a series of the house that fell off a cliff, the shed that's been blown up, you know, the, the, the money that's been run over. Um, the, the, the suit that's been shot. And so this is another kind of destructive act that I've resurrected the object and made it into a very formal drawing you know, because it is charcoal. Um, and this is the last slide, you'd be glad to know. This is a piece of um, art, art historian's navel fluff. <laughs> um, that's it. <laughs> silverware <laughs> oh that on the slide it's a teapot it's a teapot <laughs> it's recording the day it fell off by the tarnish <laughs> accruing <laughs> oh, goody, goody. <laughs> so it's something I want to know. Something I really want to know. What control did you have over the show of the tape? What control? Um, I had quite a lot of control, really. I mean, the show that's on at the Tate is the show I wanted to put on. Um, you know, there was, you know, every effort was made by the Tate for me to have the show I wanted. So the formality of it is mine. You know, the, the kind of... D deliberate formality of it is um, what I wanted. Why did you ask that question? Because I, uh, for those of you who haven't seen the show, this is a, a, a 
show of four artists for the Turner Prize, of which Connie is one. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I, find, I found the whole, the, the whole, obviously when you go there, you, you see it as a total, you sure. see it as a totality. I mean, yeah. you are part, you are a quarter yeah. of the whole. Yeah. And I found it, um, the whole experience incredibly curated, <coughs> curated right. and I right. felt that there was a big, I thought there was lots of naval blood. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and of course it's interesting because a lot of the things that you do contain addenda, you know, they contain extra proposals. Yeah. Direction. And then I became incredibly confused about who was telling me what. Right. And where it was coming from. And I almost... I think... Uh, yeah. 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 No, I think everybody curated their own bit of the show. And Virginia Button, who's the curator of the Turner Prize, was, went round on the last day or something and, and just tweaked it with us. But it, you know, it's very much up to us to present. Like Angela made Angela Bullock, I think she made a whole new show and they didn't know what she was going to make at all. So, <laughs> so uh, I think they gave us a lot of leeway, really. Isn't that interesting that I, that I felt the, the sort of, I thought I could smell the institution? Right. Oh, but was it because it's in an institution, <laughs> and I think that must probably might have alt you know might have changed the way we might have presented our work with that in mind because it is site specific after all, <laughs> you know. So, uh, but I, I, you know, the way I the show looked was the way I chose to have it look, you know, um, which is usually all always the case. You know, I don't think there's been many shows that I've done that haven't looked the way, you know, I, I you know, th I've never been over curated really. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 all the, you know, the voided objects, the title have become almost, you know, they're almost like a diptych, so it will say grooves in a record that belong to Hitler. I mean, in the, in the same sh show at the tape, there's a, a drawing made with Davy Crockett's cutthroat razor, and it's really important that that's what it's, you know, that's what it's called, so you know exactly what it is, you know, that you're looking at. I mean, they're all—I mean, they're all genuine. You know, that I went to the Alamo in Texas and I borrowed David Crockett's cut for a razor, huge sort of, you know. I could have used any record or any knife, or and, you know, for the, for the sake of the audience looking, I could have invented the title, which is, I think, you know, <coughs> is a common ruse. But uh, for, for myself, the work I'm making is is just a residue of of a process that I wanted to have. So. So the kind of work is almost like a full stop to that. So I really did want to go and get my hands on David Crockett's real cut for a razor and have the pleasure of, you know, do, you know, have, you know, having the kind of stubbornness to go through that kind of tricky process, which involved me, you know, writing to the daughters of the Republic of Texas, who are the kind of custodians of the Alamo, and having to go through all kinds of ways of getting to this thing, you know, which had not been used since the Alamo, you know. It, this thing had been deified and kept <coughs> in, in, in a glass case and not been touched really, except by the, you know, the curator or the, um, you know, the, the, the museum people. And so it's the first time it actually cut anything since you know, the men died at the Alamo. So for, for me, it's important that all this thing's authentic, but for the viewer, it doesn't really matter. You know, I mean, I know several people who've looked at the show thought it's all fake, but then that's to do with their projection. Oh, um, it was art historian's naval <coughs> fluff. <laughs> Another avoided object. I'm collecting various different professions' naval fluff. I'm hoping to get an astronaut so I can uh, <laughs> project it on the ceiling of the serpentine. <laughs> Not consciously. I mean, I think it. I think it might be there because of all the metals that I've used, but um, it's not a conscious thing. Transubstantiation is more what I'm interested in. <laughs> I mean, I've got always a surplus of ideas that I perhaps may or may never do, you know, because they're too, too hard to do in a way. And so, and sometimes they wait around for years until they get done. And then other times, a whole new idea appears, and those ideas get pushed out of the way. 
So I think it's just a very organic thing. It's not something I plan. You know, the things fall into place as I kind of work on them. You know, but I don't, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm very intuitive the way I work, and I don't really pre-plan things. Hello. About colour. Well, I think there's quite a lot of colourful work there. You know, the fruit piece was very colourful. Well, yeah, I think that's quite monochrome. I, I think actually I'm just inter interested in materials. If that has an inherent colour, then that's, you know, that's fine. But I'm not thinking about colour particularly when I'm making the work. So if copper has its own inherent colour or fruit has its, you know, or, or you know, the wallpaper that's removed in St Pancras Hotel has a bright red, then that's a, that's a you know, it's to do with the material um, rather than, you know, like when I was thinking of what to cut up with David Crockett's cup for a razor, I went through all kinds of permutations, and, and in the end, I just cut a, sh a blank sheet of white paper, you know, and in the end, that was the thing I preferred to do. Because I thought there's more space for projection. People can colour it, you know, they can make the drawing themselves then. It's not, it's not over-prescribed. Okay. <laughs> yes, Julia? Yes. Uh, did you really put your pocket money under the train? Yeah. <laughs> don't don't <laughs> people do that? I mean, I thought it was quite a common thing, really. And I had a terrible phobia of trains as well. I'm sure it's well, all very Freudian. I, mean, I haven't heard that from you, which, which was a wonderful surprise because I can see that link in that kind of attitude to something that could, by many, be precious. Well, children are very destructive beasts, aren't they? I mean, <laughs> they're always um, you destroying still, things. You still have that trend back to the work that's got through. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> trying, I'm trying to repair the damage. <laughs> 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 well, you know, attempting to repair the damage. <laughs> okay, with that, I think we should end on your behalf. Mm -hmm. I thank you very much. <laughs>